This is the final word, World Cup Daily, day eight to Jeff Lemon and Adam Collins. I'm in Lucknow, you're in London. We've just been watching Australia and South Africa. It is for Westfield, London, Westfield, Stratford City. Adam, please tell me all about today's game that you were watching as well as I was watching in the space of 30 seconds. South Africa, bad first, and it's Quinton de Kock backing up what he did a few days ago against Sri Lanka, making a 90 ball century, finishing on 109. A 108 run stand for the first wicket, a 50 run stand for the second wicket. Uh, they are in the groove. They should have probably got 320, 330, ended up with 311. Glenn Maxwell, 2 for 34 best for Australia but the collapse that came after the sixth over for Australia in reply started with the wicket of Mitch Marsh followed by Warner who slapped a ball to point they lose six for 43 by the 18th over they played for net run rate for the next two hours they're all out for 177 they lose by 134 they're in a world of pain it was a, uh, a slow motion spiff location if you will it, it took some time towards the end but my god Australia got pumped tonight um, they're part of it was a slow pumping. There are different kinds of pumpings, but this was nonetheless a pumping. Uh, were there water in the boat, it would have been out of the boat. Uh, but in fact, the boat is full of water in this analogy because it is sinking. They've lost their first two. Um, it, it's, it's not exactly panic stations completely because you can lose three or even four and still qualify for the semi-finals. But they do not look like a team that's going to find a way to get on a run from here and win six or seven in a row. They're in massive strife. Um, they needed to start the tournament well. Uh, there's a bigger picture conversation to be had about how little one-day cricket they've played between World Cups. In fact, let's go there now. The World Cup Super League, which we've been huge supporters of, but Australia missed two series within it. They had South Africa forfeit earlier this year, and they didn't go to Afghanistan. We might come back to Afghanistan in a little bit. So they only played 18 one-dayers, 18 one-dayers in that whole cycle. So a lot of emphasis has been put on uh, England uh, about how little one-day cricket they've played as defending champions. But that problem's exacerbated for Australia. They just don't feel like they've gelled in this form as yet, despite having played two series in the lead up since they went 2 0 up against South Africa. It's been pretty rugged. I mean, they had that one win against India. That's four World Cup losses in a row for the Aussies. They've never experienced that ever in the history of the tournament, where they've you know, rattled together four losses in consecutive matches. And, you know, the batting tonight was Marsh and Warner remembering they're missing Travis Head, the guy they, they expected to be opening uh, in this tournament. But, uh, Marsh gets out in a way that he often gets out, caught on the edge of the circle, trying to punch over the top of mid-off. Warner, a shot he's played a thousand times before, well outside of the off stump, a little bit of pace off from Lungi and Gidi, but picks out point. They're in strife at that point. Um, a bad decision, I thought, on face value to give Steve Smith out leg before the technology went the way of South Africa. I, I couldn't fathom at the time what was happening, nor could Joe Wilson. We might end up speaking about that in the Hall of Fame. Stoinis gets a fundamentally bad decision from Richard Kettlebrough, the third umpire involved again. Uh, Glenn Maxwell never got going. Shamsi gets him caught and bowled in there, completely stuffed, and all Arbuchain and Stark could do is hold on to try and preserve as much net run rate as they could. And, this is what we spoke about the other day, Jeff, isn't it? That when a side's chasing, when they're in trouble early uh, and they're behind the game, chasing in a one-day game, even though net run rate's technically there to speed up the game, um, Australia uh, picked the right option, which is drag it as deep as they could, but uh, they were never going to hold on for that long. Yeah, well, I mean, you, you've got to... It's not just about dragging it deep. You have to keep scoring at the same time. You know, if you bat out 30 overs without scoring, then you end up with the same net run rate as if you've been bowled out. 30 overs earlier, so there is that point. Um, and, and they ticked along, you know, Stark and Labuschagne. They were on a hiding to nothing at that point. It's the 18th over, you're, you're 70 to the 6. You're screwed. Yeah. Like, what are you going to do? Like, how are you going to save the game? And, you know, and I'm sure there'll be some people who'll get stuck into Marnus for chipping the cover on 46 or whatever it was, but um, the, the, at least he actually made a score and hung around for a while. But people will get stuck into it for batting too slowly, more to the point. They'll say, oh, they'll look at the scorecard and say 46 off. 70, whatever it was, and talk about the fact that he didn't attack enough. Well, there was no point in attacking if he was an attacker and got out, or okay, they get bowled out in the 22nd over, and things are even worse. Um, in terms of the net run rate damage limitation that they achieved, it probably isn't significant. Like Australia's going to have a, uh, a very damaged net run rate anyway, given that India chased uh, so briskly yep. in their previous match, and, and given that they've been absolutely punched up in this game. I mean, an extraordinary just dissolution. So at the halfway mark, our conversations here at the ground were sort of like, oh, what do you think? Did they, they let South Africa get 20 or 30 too many? You know, it might be 300, might be a bit tall. Like maybe they could chase 270 on this. They weren't chasing anything on this. 
Um, it, it, was, it was difficult immediately. South Africa looked at what Australia did and what Australia learned to do in the back 15 or 20 overs of the innings, which was take the pace off, roll the cutters, drive it into the surface, all the rest of it. And Ngidi started doing that immediately. He conceded four runs off his first four overs and gets Warner with the last ball of his fourth over. Um, they just couldn't score. So they were, what, 16 off the first five overs. And if Australia were going to chase 300 on that pitch, they needed Marsh and Warner to come out and start bashing the fast bowlers around in the way that Marsh and Warner have done in recent times. But it wasn't that kind of surface. And as soon as they tried to force the pace, both of them fell. Yeah, and, and it's pretty handy having Kiyosa Rabada coming on first change, right? He has two for eight at one stage, you know, in yeah. the second over, including Smith, which, yeah, again, <laughs> it's a tough one, isn't it? Like, we see it live, we see the, the third umpire process, nobody thinks it's out. Joel Wilson, when he puts his finger up, he can't believe that he has to change his decision. Um, we don't actually get a replay on television for about five minutes after that. They didn't do the full Hawkeye projection like they ordinarily would. I reckon everyone yep. was just taking a beat, making sure there hadn't been some error made. And look, with the benefit of hindsight, Smith was across his stumps and, you know, I don't want to start going conspiracy theorist and, and on, it, on, on, on the... the ball. The ball came in a little bit, you know, yeah. if you if you watch the full animation through, it does sort of deck in a little bit, and so it hits him in front of leg, the still image makes it look like it's going way down, but it has straightened up by that point, um, and this was a pitch that kept low, so it wasn't that surprising that it, that it um, wasn't clearing the stumps, even though it hit him just above the knee roll, but the fact that the animation didn't happen, suddenly, you know, I was on commentary at the time, suddenly they just flash up the three yeah. reds out and everybody was looking around going hang on what the hell is going on here Smith was bemused Labashane was bemused um, it, it took everybody a while to figure out what's actually going on it wasn't any controversy around Josh Inglis's uh, removal for uh, what was it yeah, boy it was out no. very briskly a four ball um, five he hit a boundary and it was bowled by Rabada yeah. comprehensively Matt Hayden on commentary said he missed a straight one he didn't miss a straight one as um, uh, Nasser Hussain and Aaron Finch explained it that angled in and decked away and hit off stump it was a beauty he gave those um Barack Coley eyes, didn't he, from that ball that uh, knocked him over from Mo and Ali. Uh, it might have been Adel Rashid. No, it was Mo and Ali, wasn't it, in, in a test match in, um, yep. gosh, I don't know when it was anymore, but I know it was an England spinner that removed 2021. 2021, when he stared down the pitch like, how did that happen? It was the same for Inglis, who was brought into the side for Alex Carey. That was a big strategic call or tactical mm. decision from the Australian management to part ways with Carey so quickly. We talked about it the other night, the, the grouping of scores for Carey either side of his 99, pretty much from the point where he stumped Johnny Best at Lords, if you want to drag it all the way back, has been patchy at best. He's getting starts occasionally, rarely going on with it. Um, I can understand why they wanted to pull that rein, but equally, um, when it doesn't come off and you've uh, left the senior player out, and he did drop a catch in, that's a tough one off Sampa, one of, haven't even talked about the, the drop catches for Australia. There must six. have been five or six of them by the time they were done. Yeah, we'll, yeah, six, um, the, the long counted here. Um, uh, and I mean, I guess we'll, we'll get to that South Africa innings uh, in a bit. We're starting at the back. Sure. But the English call, I mean, that that is bewildering to me. Uh, that you can make the argument that Kerry hasn't been in hot form and whatever. Okay, well, that means he shouldn't have been in the squad or he shouldn't have been in the 11. He should have been the backup keeper. You don't come into a World Cup with your first choice keeper who has been your first choice keeper across formats for several years at this point. Let him play one game, face two balls, make a duck, and then say, "Sorry, champ, you're out." That that is that is panic selection. Mm. That is not. There is no composure to that. There is no planning to that. Um, five innings ago in one-day cricket against the same team he's playing tonight, he made 99. And yes, that was in South Africa. Um, and yeah, maybe they're basing this partly on the fact that he really struggled with the bat in Australia's Test series in India earlier this year. And they're saying, "Okay, well, when the pitch is turning, he's he's not up to it." Well, why is he in your team? Why'd you bring him to the World Cup if that's the case? Why'd you pick him at Chennai? Are they saying, okay, we'll leave him out of the two Lucknow games because it might turn and then bring him back? Well, okay, that, how's that going to help him when he comes back when he's already been left out? None of that makes any sense to me. It's a, it's a bizarre rain to pull to bring your backup keeper into game two of the World Cup. Um, I have no idea what the Australian team managed to do. Yeah, selection's tough in World Cups. I mean, often there is less latitude for players and... Often it can be players that start outside the 11 that end up being really important in the final analysis. And they, they might have thought on what they were seeing in the nets and so on that Inglis was in good nick. It's really hard to get in the middle of all of this. What I know for sure is that this is the biggest challenge in Pat Cummins' career, not just his leadership, but his career. I know Cummins picked up a couple of late wickets, I think it was today, and didn't do anything particularly wrong with the ball. But going back to Leeds in the Ashes series, uh, Cummins has been under the pump in ways that haven't been 
case until this stage of his uh, yep. captaincy tenure or, or as a player. And until that stage, he's been untouchable as a bowler um, across the formats, really, with a couple of minor exceptions and had the Midas touch as captain yep. initially, at least, beating England comfortably, beating Pakistan in Pakistan, uh, having a you know a home summer last year, which was a bit of a non-event, but nevertheless successful. Um, then 2-0 up in an Ashes series, and I know they, they didn't do um, exactly what they wanted to do in, in India and lost two test matches under his leadership before he went home. But yeah, it does feel like it'll, it'll be something. And every cricketer has this, right? Every single player or captain goes through a period of time when they have to find something else, they have to dig deep and Cummins has the character to do that, but it's going to be very difficult for him to keep the show on the road uh, when they've got no latitude in a bunch of games that are going to be tough to win, not least Sri Lanka, um, if it continues to turn at luck now. Well, he had a, a weird game tonight, and not least the drop catch off Aidan yep. Markram before he oh, he was on two, was he, at the time. Uh, it was a, a, a full toss that Cummins was expecting to get smashed, and instead it was chipped back to him, probably slower than he expected, and let it through his hands. Markram makes a, a 50 or 40 balls, punishes them, and then even something like that weird review that he took against Tocot where, you know, oh, yeah. was half appeals, Cummins half appeals, he sends it upstairs and then walks back to the top of his mark to wait for the not-out decision. Like, it, it didn't it didn't suggest that somebody, it was somebody who was in control of what was going on out there. So just some weird decision-making. Um, Quentin de Kock, brilliant again, run of all 100, did his job at the top of the order. Bavuma struggled for timing, made 35 off 50 odd balls um, and eventually got out with the first wicket to fall, but he'd helped put on a 100 partnership by then. Mm -hmm. um, Maxwell takes the wicket after coming on during the power play, you know, stiff task that he was set, ends up 10 overs, 2 for 34, fell brilliantly throughout, and largely because Quentin de Kock was worried about Glenn Maxwell. So, uh, yeah, this was an interesting part, right? So, Quentin de Kock's building these big partnerships. Everybody makes some runs through the middles, 20, through the middle 20s and 30s, um, and they're helping him out. But every time it looks like he's about to monster Australia, he hits some big sixes, hooks really well, plays the short ball really well, but he's really worried about Maxwell. Um, in a press conference before the game, he singled out Maxwell and said Maxwell's an underrated bowler and, and like the sides try to attack him too much. And he lived his values on that front because he was very cautious against Maxwell. Faced out a maiden from him in the middle. There were a lot of overs that were going for two or three singles here or there. And eventually, the first time Pekok plays an attacking shot against Maxwell, a sort of standing reverse sweep, misses it, the ball hits his chest, rolls back onto his stumps and his bowl. So I don't know if he talked himself into getting out to Glenn Maxwell, um, but it was, it, was, it was the thing that meant that South Africa, when they were, they were 158 for one, had just passed the halfway mark. They should have been making 360 from there, you would think but they end up with just past 300 uh, because Quentin de Kock couldn't put the foot down against Maxwell through those 10 Yeah, so like after that long partnership, I mean, Australia take wickets, a couple of wickets in a row, like in the in the, in the 20s, let's say, overs uh, gone, that is, and Hazelwood eventually, um, you know, it, it has um, de Kock hit consecutive sixes off him. You know, Mitchell Marsh can't quite take one that goes over his shoulder. The next one goes miles over his head. Maxwell gets that, that first wicket. Finally, uh, the luck stops for the captain, Bavuma, having been dropped three or four times. And Maxwell's carrying his weight. You know, he bowled in over seven today, over nine against India. Never easy for a spinner inside the power play, which is why we see so little of it. But he's stepping up on, on that front. But, um, yeah, the, the reality is, is that he's batting without confidence. We saw um, he, he play out. It wasn't a maiden from... Uh, Maharaj, who bowled delightfully this evening, two for 30 from 10. A lot of that was when Australia were going slow and, and playing for time. But, but still, you've got to you know, send the overs down and do what you need to do. And Maxwell's always a key wicket. And uh, the way in which he made Maxwell absorb five dot balls when Rivada was bowling heat and really getting it to move off the surface down the other end, had to attack Maharaj. Um, and it was kind of an odd dismissal off the back of the bat, leading edge back to the bowler. But you could see at the end of the previous Maharaj over, Maxwell talking to himself, kind of haunched over a little bit. So, you know, we know he's a confidence cricketer. He always has been. Um, and that's not ideal that he's two games in, two low scores. But he's bowling, he's, he's playing his part as well. So, um, you know, they, they, yeah. they, they aren't going to make a change like that to the 11. They, they made one other change today with Stornis returning for Cam Green, it's pretty clear where uh, they sit in the pecking order, those two all-rounders, and we may as well talk about the, the decision uh, to give Stoinis out by Kettleborough, where it looked to me, Jeff, and you'll have a view on this too, having been on commentary, that Kettleborough saw the two gloves together on the 
side on split screen and as Brat Sunderation explained to me when I was messaging him after it does it work like electricity if one glove's touching the handle and the other glove's touching the other glove does it continue through he's like yes that's correct it does continue through that that was the correct interpretation yep. by Kettlebra that the issue was on the other side of the split screen the front on um, you could see there was a huge gap between the gloves so you know Stoinis comes and goes and and from that point it's a, a bit of a train wreck but yeah the two hard hitters Maxwell yep. Stoinis um, neither of whom had a platform to really go from today after the quick wickets and that's a failing of the, the top order players but yeah there, there's there's um there, there's i mean it's all going wrong isn't it yeah i mean it was definitely the wrong decision um from my interpretation maybe kettlebury thought that it clipped the the other glove or the bat handle on the way through because it was very close to that other glove as well um, but you know what it, what it ended up looking like is that it had hit the glove that was taken off the bat yeah um, and, and that wasn't touching it the other one so but you know whatever these, these are fine margins in the end um, and it wouldn't have made a difference you know had that been in the last over when they needed 10 to win then sure um, we could carry on about it but when the difference between 5 for 70 and 6 for 70 probably wasn't um, going to make much difference at that point anyway um, and Adam Zampa my last point about what's happened yep. here um, what, 1 for 70 71 not bowling with a great deal of confidence either bowled better had an easier time of it at least today um, because it wasn't evening and the ball wasn't slippery but you've got one spinner in your squad what do you do like sure if they get injured you can replace them what do you do if they just get pumped three four five games in a row did you just have to keep picking them through to the end of the tournament because you've got no other option well in 2019 Zampa lost his spot you know yeah. he, Nathan Lyon ended up being the spinner at the pointy end of the tournament now I don't think they would do that to Zampa who's been one of the uh, one of the most effective spinners on the planet over the last four years mm. but Nathan Lyon's not there. Nathan Lyon did say no in an interview the other with. day that he's available to come over if required, but I mean, I don't think that's, that's any real way of doing that other than the method you described the other day, the fry pan over the head um, <laughs> displacement, if you like, of yep. an existing squad member. So that's not going to happen. Hey, can I just raise one other point, Jeff, that's a bit left field, but I think it relates to a number of conversations we had earlier in the year on the weekly show. So we, had a, we made a long episode when Australia made the call not to play the three one days against Afghanistan. So I discussed already how they've played six fewer matches than pretty much every other team coming into the World Cup through the World Cup Super League. They made the choice to miss those three games in the UAE earlier in the year. Um, you know, surprise, surprise, it did come at a relatively inconvenient time in the schedule after the India series before the IPL, if memory serves me correctly. Um, and CA said they, they couldn't abide playing against the nation who had made decisions as the Taliban in November and December last year to suppress educational opportunities for girls and women more generally. Um, the decision was that an Australian side should not play Afghanistan in those circumstances. Well, any route for Australia now to the semi-finals of this tournament has to go through beating Afghanistan on the 7th of November. We speculated, cynically perhaps, uh, that Australia having Afghanistan so late in the group stage could enable them to boycott that closer to the time if they already had a semi-final berth wrapped up. Well, having lost their first two games, they're going to have to beat Afghanistan. But are they not duty-bound, based on the statements they made earlier this year, um, to forfeit uh, this game in November? No one made them uh, say what they said earlier this year. And I'm not getting stuck into them for saying it, but they've got a standard they have to uphold now, don't they? Yeah, um, that's the position they put themselves in, unless they can find some way to cleverly uh, make an allowance in the way that India plays Pakistan in global tournaments while refusing to play them outside those tournaments. If they can say, well, it's our responsibility to the collective, you know, to everybody, because we're all in this together, we can't make a unilateral decision about a bilateral series because this isn't, this is, this is an all-in. So I think that's the line they'll probably try to run, um, but it doesn't really stand up to ethical scrutiny. No, that, that's right. I just, I just think it's worth marking a place there because, you know, if they had Afghanistan first up, uh, as they did in 2019, th there would have been a number of stories about this. But because it's so far away, it's so deep into the competition, there's no attention on it yet. But now, Australia at Norton 2, they have one other game after Afghanistan. They play Bangladesh last, but in reality, uh, the probability of them with such a bad net run rate getting through without beating Afghanistan is, is next to nothing. So. Um, I watch this space on this one, and it is the sort of question that should be asked of uh, Nick Hockley, the chief executive, who was, again, I'm, I'm not being critical of what CA said at the time, but if you make a decision to take a stand like this and to, you know, to receive uh, the plaudits of the pundits at the time who said that this was a, a good thing for Australia to be doing, then it's a standard you have to uphold when 
times are tough as well, or, or not. And if you don't, you've got to be held to scrutiny for it. Mm. All right, let's take ourselves to the final word, Hall of Fame. All right, the final word, Hall of Fame, Jeff, uh, brought to you by London, uh, Westfield London and Westfield Stratford City. Play more and pay less with Westfield London Extra Pass and you could win a £1,000 gift okay. card for just signing up. Here's how it works. You collect virtual stickers every time you spend 25 quid at a participating retailer and earn increasing discounts the more stickers that you collect. Every sticker is another entry to the grand prize draw. So the more runs you hit at sixes, the more walls you scale at city bouldering, the more cats you pet at Java whiskers, the more chances you have to win. At Google Westfield London, and follow the prompts. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, <laughs> wait a minute. How, hold on, you can you can pat cats? This is this Westfield? is one of the things that is at Westfield London, Java Whiskers. It must be a cat cafe. We were explaining what a cat cafe. We were explaining what a cat cafe was to Winnie the other day. We've reached that stage of any wow. three year old's life where she wants a oh. cat. Wants a dog, Rachel saying, No, I'm away too much, not unreasonable. There'll be compromise found around a cat eventually, right? I come from a crazy cat sure. family, as you know. Um, but not yet. And a compromise we found in the short term is maybe taking me into one of these uh, cat cafes. And Java Whiskers could be exactly that. So all you need to do is Google Westfield London, follow the prompt, sign up for the Westfield London Extra Pass today. T's and C's apply as ever. The prize draw is only open to UK residents. Westfield London, Westfield Stratford City, more extra, less ordinary. What was your final word moment of the day, Jeff? Well, I've, I've only got one, um, but it's, it's, it's a little longer than others might be, but I think okay. this is one that you may enjoy, you may appreciate. Okay, so a little bit of backstory, a bit of context. When Mitchell Stark played the warm-up game against the Netherlands and, and took that hat-trick, mm. we noted that he was wearing green skin, yes. green sort of uh, tight sleeves under his shirt. And you and I had a conversation about this because you, uh, quite correctly in that weird brain of yours, remembered Shane Warne wearing a black T-shirt under his playing shirt run me through that yeah, again yeah so in 99 against scotland the first game they played in that world cup was a really cold day and warney wore a black t-shirt that was clearly visible underneath the yellow playing shirt and he got sanctioned well, i say sanctioned he got told off by the icc and told not to wear it again i note that now david warner wears a black t-shirt underneath and you know times have changed and all the rest of it but yeah i was reminded of that when stark was getting around in the green sleeves um, uh, right. which we talked about on the weekly show. And he, and he traded them in for gold sleeves against India and the green sleeves were back today. Yeah, so that's so I thought when he played against India that someone at the ICC had said, no, you've got to wear ones that match the, the playing shirt. But the green ones were back tonight. So we were like, okay, what's going on there? Did a bit of digging and found out this is actually a commercial side venture for Mitchell Stark, ah. which is that he's involved. He and Elisa Healy are involved in, with the company that makes these sleeves. But I was trying to figure out what was going on with this company, right? Because the company is called, like the name as it appeared on uh, on the URL was Sparms, S-P-A-R-M-S. And I was like, what is Sparms? Or is it S Palms? It's like capital S, capital P. And then eventually worked out that it was S-P Arms. And let me run you through this, right? Because players wear, they wear skins to protect themselves while fielding and, and you know, not to take the skin off. and uh, Or maybe their compression yep. style and they help the circulation or all these kinds of things. This website, I've got to read you a bit of this copy because this is some good stuff here. This taps into some press release energy that we like on this show. Um, SP Arms, a leading Australian sun protection company, is thrilled to announce a groundbreaking partnership with renowned Australian cricketers Mitchell Stark and Elisa Healy. Get this, this collaboration, a culmination of 12 months of meticulous planning and dedication, marks a pivotal moment in the realm of sport and sun protection. Hold up, record scratch, rewind. These sleeve things are for sun protection? Like, yeah, you need to protect your arms from the sun. Have you heard about sleeves? I, I, have, you, <laughs> have you just invented sleeves? You're a company that spent a year of dedicated energy inventing the sleeve. Uh, like, how do I possibly protect my arms while wearing this short-sleeved shirt? If only there was some way, if only there was some method that these short sleeves could be extended in some way. Congratulations, you have invented the sleeve. According to this mob, uh, they have set out to revolutionise the way athletes approach sun safety on the field. This is revolutionary stuff here. Sleeves, you heard it here first. I think it's big in golf, isn't it? I mean, that's more something I would know and you wouldn't. I'm pretty sure golfers wear... Um, these um, 
for these lengthy skids so they can still... I don't really know why. I'm not going to pretend to have any extra knowledge on this, but um, well, welcome the spams to the cricket, I suppose, or the SP arms. Um, the spams. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That's a, John Spams. That, that's, a, uh, that's a great nomination. Um, I've already mentioned the Joel Wilson finger rise. He was like, what the fuck is going on? Shaking his head as he's yes. raising the finger. Um, and the, and the uh -huh. Joel Inglis doing the Brat Coley eyes, which I really enjoyed, as I did NASA and... and Joel Inglis? Joel Inglis. Joel Inglis. Joel Inglis. Joel Inglis. <laughs> Josh Inglis. Uh, Josh Philippi, Ryan Philippi. Who knows? Um, Josh Philippi, Ryan Philippi. Uh, when, I was a, when I was a kid, Jeff, when I was an 18-year-old, I did a year working as a bank teller. That was my first university job, and I loved doing it. Mm -hmm. and, huh. and you learn there um, that it's very easy to do a thing called transposing numbers, so um, uh, where, you know, um, one number becomes the other in your brain. You muddle it up, and that's an easy way to end up with your cash yep. draw out by a weird number at the end of the day. NASA did that on to the, on comms today when talking about Rohit Sharma having made nine World Cup hundreds in 17 hits, and he quickly corrected himself. Actually, it's seven World Cup hits, seven World Cup tons rather. Okay. No, I did it again from 19 hits, and um, he corrected himself. I'm like, aha! I know what he did there. That's a that's a thing I used to do when yep. I was a, a kid uh, as a bank oh. teller. I've got one more for you on number transposition. Yeah. Um, for a while, for about 10 minutes today, the digital scoreboards all went down. Um, I was having to do it from memory on commentary, which is a weird thing yeah. to do. Um, and and, and there, there's an old manual scoreboard on the far side of the ground, and we spotted it, and we were like, finally, it's the time for the manual scoreboard to shine. It turns out that they transposed the numbers accidentally. So every time a single was scored, say, the, the score went from 43 to then 53, to then 63, to then 73, <laughs> to 83, as, as the South Africans were ticking along singles. So that score was wrong. The other score was non-existent. And I was like frantically signaling with Phil Long trying to remember what the score was because, you know, we don't generally keep track of it that closely manually if you can see it in front of you on a screen. Um, so yeah, number transposition was the theme of the day. We have gone very long on this episode, which I think is fair given Australia got absolutely pumped. Um, and this is a crisis episode, yes. but we should probably wrap it up. Just one more thing, Jeff. You, you have a, a affection, an affection with press releases for HCL technology. They're now on the arms. Oh, They're that. now on the arms of the Australian uniform. So the underneath spams. the spams, you can see HCL technology. Uh, that is the final word, Hall oh, of Fame. If HCL and spams together get at together last. and write a press release, <laughs> that would be the press release baby to end all press releases. Bring it on. Make sure you Google what I mentioned before, the London Extra Pass uh, in all the usual Westfield places. Uh, that's it for today. South Africa uh, are up to Durham Charlotte next. They play the Netherlands on Tuesday, so we'll have a mini break from them there. Um, Australia play Sri Lanka at the same venue, Lucknow, where you'll be staying as well, Jeff, on yep. Monday, which is legitimately must win. Otherwise, they'll go the same way that South Africa went in 2019, zip and three out of the comp, just about. Uh, tomorrow, it's New Zealand against Bangladesh. They can go three and zip. It'll be a long way towards making the semi finals themselves. And then on Saturday, of course, it will be India and Pakistan. This has been the Final Word Daily. Australia are battling South Africa, lying top of the table. See you tomorrow. See you later.